All right, so we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 in just a moment. If, you, if you'd like to turn there, we're just going to look at, at two verses there in Hebrews chapter 11. And as you're turning there, I want to, I want to kind of start off with this question. Have you ever had a time where you start out on a journey and you realize shortly thereafter this isn't the direction you want to be heading? <laughs> you ever done that? Uh, I have. Um, if you recall last time that I was speaking here, I, I drove to Tulsa. I have no idea why. Um, all right. I guess I just like traffic. I don't know. And so... But we, we, we've had those moments maybe where we start off and, and we're going in a direction and then we soon realize this isn't really where I want to go. Maybe it's a job that you were excited about. You, you get the job and, and, you're, and you're really excited and you're, and you're happy and you're telling everyone, yeah, this is my new job. Here's my business card, whatever it is. And then the economy falls apart a little bit. Maybe your department downsized. And all the things that you loved about your job, you're now going, eh, I don't really want to be here anymore. Maybe it was a church at some time in your life. One that you were just so pumped up about, that you were so on fire for the Lord to go there. But then after a little while, you realize, this isn't really what I thought it was going to be. We have those moments. And I wonder if the people of Israel ever felt that as they were exiting Egypt. I mean, they had been 400 years in slavery in Egypt. And now it's time for them to go. Right? Remember the whole, let my people go. You know, Moses going before Pharaoh, saying, let my people go. Or maybe it's Pharaoh, Pharaoh. All right. <laughs> let my people go. All right. Let my people go. And he keeps saying, no, I'm going to let them go. I almost felt like I was teaching kids. No, we won't let them. Okay. So Pharaoh keeps saying, no, we're not going to do it. I'm not going to let these people go. But then finally he says, okay, you can go. And the Israelites are, are, are having this parade, right? That's how I picture it. All right. They're throwing candy to the kids. I don't know, probably not that far. But they're having this, this parade. They're exciting. They're excited. They're, they're jubilant as they're leaving Egypt, I imagine. And they get to the Red Sea and they're not sure what they're going to do. But God provides a way. But it seems like shortly in their journey, they say, this is really in the direction I want to be going after all. And their excitement is gone. And they get in their minds that perhaps this journey isn't even worth it. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about all the great things, people and, and nations of faith. Talks about all these, I, I call it the hall of faith. And it's, it's these men and these women that, it's, that it writes about had so much faith. But something interesting takes place in verse 29 and verse 30. Verse 29 of Hebrews chapter 11 says, By faith the people, the Israelites, passed through the Red Sea as though it were on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. That's day one. Day one. Ex exciting. It's talking about, I mean, this is a parade going on here. I'm imagining so much excitement. They pass through on dry, on dry land, right? Pass through the Red Sea. Not, not it parted and they walked through in the mud a little bit, but on dry land. That's miraculous. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they drowned. And then, verse 30, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. Something's missing here. I'm going to read it again. Let's see. Verse 29 and 30. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned by faith. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. What happened? 
to 40 years of history for God's people. Why does it say, why is it talking about day one of leaving Egypt, and then all of a sudden the very next thing it talks about is Jericho? Something happens 40 years worth of history here. In that 40 years, Israel is set up as a nation. During that 40 years, the priesthood is established. During that 40 years, the tabernacle is built. During that 40 years, the Mount Sinai experience where the Ten Commandments is given. Yet it's completely skipped over whenever it describes great faith. Interesting. Why does it do that? There's no mention of it. The Red Sea, amazing faith. It would have to take amazing faith to kind of walk through a sea. And then all of a sudden, Jericho. We're missing all these years. What happened to a generation of God's people that were marched out into the desert led by God for a very great purpose? They get all in the, within the first year. They get water from the rock. They get manna from heaven. The quail come. Um, Moses is on Mount Sinai. The law is given. And they look at the promised land. They can see it. They send spies in there to tell them about it. There's two ways to get into the desert. One, God can lead you there. He led them here. This was all within the first year. God's led them through the desert. But they have to go through the desert to get to the promised land. In the New Testament, we read about Jesus being led out into the wilderness, into the desert. Where he's tried and tempted by Satan. Forty days. During the first year, God led the people physically. But the people did not follow spiritually. They grumble, they complain, they fight amongst themselves, they disrespect their leaders. And the second time they're in a desert, it's their own doing, because they rejected the promised land. Remember they sent the, the spies in, and they're like, oh man, this, this place is just what was described. I mean, it is, it is flowing with milk and honey. That sounds sticky. I was thinking that veggie pill song. All right. It says it's flowing with milk and honey. I mean, this place has an abundance. Everything that we would possibly need or want is in this land. But those people are big. And we can't beat them. Let's go back to the desert. And they go back into the desert and they wander for 40 years. What does it take for God's people to move through the desert and live like promised land people. First, I think we should understand that we are a people of freedom, not a people of slavery. The promise was for abundance, and the promise was for blessing. God's people were never intended to be slaves, to remain slaves. Exodus chapter 3 over there. Exodus chapter 3, verse, beginning in verse 7, says this. The Lord said, he's speaking to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down, I have come down, to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them out to that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. The promise is for abundance. The, the promise was for them to have a, a land that they could call their own. The promise was that they could have, a, have a, a place where they were no longer slaves. 
good things were intended for them. I love the verse in Galatians that says it is for freedom that you have been set free. God desires us to live in freedom. Not to be slaves. But yet for, for ages, for, for years, God's people tend to make themselves slaves. I'm, I'm a slave to my own prejudice, to my past, to my sin, to my, tr- to my traditions. <clears throat> Why do we who are set free still live like we're in slavery? I wonder if it's because like the people of Israel, instead of taking the risk of faith, of fully trusting in God's promises, we start to get comfortable in our slavery. Because freedom is scary. I mean, those people were big. They were strong. And that's what the spies said. All but two of them. All but Caleb and Joshua. They're too big for us. We can't take them. We're too afraid. And it's easier to stay in slavery than to struggle through the desert in order to get freedom. They kept complaining, didn't they? We should have just stayed in Egypt and died. We should have just stayed in Egypt. At least they took care of us. Moses, you brought us out here to die. And they keep complaining. We're just going to die in the heat. And then we're going to die of starvation. And so God gives them manna. And they're like, we're tired of manna. We want meat. And he gives them quail. And I love it because it says he gave them quail up to their nose. I mean, you want some meat? Here's you some meat. All right. So... They keep complaining. But it's easier to stay in slavery than to struggle through the desert in order to find our promised land. I mean, we get spurts of freedom. Sometimes in a, in a small group of people, we can be real on occasion. We can say what we really believe. We get an occasional place to share our struggles. I mean, our real struggles. Our real struggles. But then under the canopy of the gathering of God's people, fear causes us to stay trapped. Stay trapped in our slavery sometimes. I loved walking in and seeing, uh, seeing a new setup. It was very welcoming there in the foyer. Very nice. I remember the first time I came, I was like, whoa, I don't feel welcome here. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. Um, you made me feel welcome, but the environment didn't. So, but I do have this question for us, all right? And I'm not a paid minister, so that's why I can ask it, okay? <laughs> if a new song or a new setup or a visitor bringing a bottle of water or their coffee into the auditorium can throw off our worship so much that that distracts us, then are we even free? I don't believe we're really free people if that stuff can distract us so much from our worship of God. If those things throw us off, then we're not, then we'd rather be people of slavery than freedom. Slaves to our tradition, to our upbringing, we can call it what we want. We can call it well respect. It's the tradition. And, and we make ourselves slaves to these things. Where I look at you differently because I, you disagree with me or I disagree with you. And, and, and so I wonder if we create this culture of slavery in the church. If we're going to pass through this desert period, we must stop getting better. We must start getting better at being free and stop making ourselves and others better at being slaves. I know we have our preferences. I have mine. I do. I think every song we, should, we sing in worship should be worship songs written in the 1990s. You know why? Because that's when I was closest and I was coming to know God. 
All right, Rich Mullins, Dennis Jernigan. I mean, like, play it, you know? But I also, I also love a good hymn. But you know what? If I say, man, we don't ever sing these songs anymore, all right? We've got to, all right. I remember every Sunday. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. All right. You are my all in all by Dennis Jernigan. Every week, I loved it. All right, then he started like changing it. Then he put some new stuff. And then I go and somebody else sings it differently than I learned it. I actually went to um, a night of worship with Dennis Jernigan and he sang it different than I learned it. So I didn't like him singing it. I mean, it was, he wrote it. And, and so, but I can make myself a slave pretty easily. And I cannot experience freedom because I'm like, he shouldn't be singing it that way. <laughs> and if I was going to preach that sermon, I would have used a different text than he used. And, and we can get caught up, caught up in our, in, our, in our being slaves to whatever, slaves to our tradition, slaves to our preferences, when we're supposed to be a free people. It's okay to have preferences. I'm not saying we shouldn't. You know, I mean, I, I got preferences in everything. I prefer a certain type of music. I got my own chair at home. That if my kid or my wife is sitting there, I'm like, you need to move. It's my chair. You know? And we'll have a guest and I'll be like, hey, come here and get your plate. And they'll go get their plate and I'll go sit down in my chair real quick. Like, I have my preferences, right? I'm a slave to that chair, maybe. I don't know. It's the, it, 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 I feel the air conditioning the best in that spot. I sound like that guy on Big Bang Theory. It's like, it's where the, where the air hits just right. It's just a perfect distance from the TV. It's the closest one to the kitchen. I mean, it's, it's perfect. Perfect. But you know what happens? Is if somebody sits there and I sit in a different spot, I feel real uncomfortable. In my own home. And that can happen in my spiritual life as well. Maybe it was uh, when I came to this church, this guy was the, led the worship. He led the music. And I loved it. And then we got a new guy. Not so good. I don't know. We have preferences that we can be slaves of. But what we need is we need leaders that will help push us to our destiny and not teach us how to live in a desert. Because the desert is supposed to be temporary. But I become and we become experts at desert living. Almost said dessert, apparently. Um, but God is a God of the promised land who just happened to visit the desert. That's what we're supposed to be. Promised land people. The Israelites kept passing by the promised land. I mean, if you're reading Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Okay, if you were reading it, you're going to see they keep, like, there's the promised land, let's go. They're still too big. There's the promised land, but we didn't have enough faith. There's the promised land, but we're scared. There's the promised land, but whenever they write Hebrews, they're not even going to talk about us. I mean, yeah, they probably didn't think that for it, but... were too scared to go. They didn't have enough faith. They were slaves to their fear. We need people who are willing to stand up, to grab their family, to grab their kids, to grab their grandkids, and they say, let's do this. Let's trust God completely. Let's live in freedom. Let's stop being slaves to our fear. Let's stop being slaves to our past. Let's stop being slaves to yesterday, and let's move forward. We need people to do that. There was a man that was uh, passing through upstate uh, Vermont. He got his car stuck in a ditch. Guy comes along on a horse-drawn carriage. He says, you need help getting out? Said, um, yeah, sure, I'd love to have a little help. So he, he 
ties the chain to the car and he ties it to his horse. And he's like, you, you think that horse can pull a car? Oh, buddy, he's a strong horse. Buddy's a really strong horse. Okay. A couple minutes pass and he goes, go, Nelly! What? Go, Buzz! Huh? Go, Nick! And he goes, I thought his name was Buddy. And he goes, his name is Buddy, but if he thinks he's pulling alone, he's not even going to try. <laughs> you see, sometimes, sometimes we need somebody that says, hey, I'm pulling with you. I'm, I'm going with you. All right? Because we, we go around and we feel like we're all alone in life. And I'm a slave to my loneliness, and I'm a slave to my depression, and I'm a slave to my, to my fear or to my anxiety or, or fill in the blank. And we need somebody who says, hey, I'm pulling with you, but I'm not going to let you stay there. I'm not going to let you stay stuck in a ditch. I'm going to help pull you out because we're going to the promised land. And that's what we need. We need somebody that's going to help us get to the promised land, to get the freedom because it's the promise of God. I brought this up here because I wanted to share something from, remember the old book, Chicken Soup for the Soul? Yeah. And uh, so you probably never heard of it. It didn't sell many copies. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then they made chicken soup for everybody's life, for the teacher's soul, for the fireman's soul, for, I don't know, for the everybody's soul, I guess. I used to have this memorized, but it's been a while since I've done it, so... In 1989, an 8.2 earthquake nearly flattened Armenia, killing over 30,000 people in less than four minutes. In the midst of utter de devastation and chaos, a father left his wife securely at home, and he rushed to his school where his son was supposed to be, only to discover that the building was been completely flattened. After the traumatic initial shock, he remembered a promise that he made to his son when he said, no matter what, I will always be there for you. And tears began to fill his eyes as he looked at the pile of debris that once was a school. It looked so hopeless. But he kept remembering his commitment to his son and that promise that he made. And he began to concentrate on where he would drop his son off each morning to class. Remembering that his son's room would be in the far back right corner of the building. He headed that way and he rushed there and he started digging through the rubble. As he was digging, other parents arrived, clutching their hearts, saying, my son, my daughter. Other well-meaning parents tried to pull him off of what was left of school, telling him, it's too late. They're, they're dead. You can't help them. Go home. Come on, man. Face reality. There's nothing you can do. You're making things worse. And to each parent, he responded with one line. Are you going to help me now? And then he proceeded to dig for his son, stone by stone. The fire chief showed up and tried to pull him off the school's debris, saying, Fires are breaking out. Explosions are happening. You're in danger. We will take care of it. You go home. To which this loving, caring father asked, Are you going to help me now? The police came and said, you're angry and you're distraught. It's over. You're endangering others. Please go home. We will handle it. To which he replied, are you going to help me now? But nobody helped. Courageously, that man proceeded alone because he needed to know for himself, was his son alive or was he dead? He dug eight hours, 12 hours. 24, 36 hours. Finally, in the 38th hour, he pulled back a boulder and he heard his son's voice. He screamed his son's name, Armand. He heard back, Dad, it's me, Dad. I told these kids not to worry. I told them that if you were alive, that you would save me. And when you saved me, they also would be saved. You promised no matter what, I'll be there for you. You did it, Dad. Father asked, what's going on? How's the situation? The son says, there's 14 of us left out of 33. We're scared, 
We're very hungry, we're thirsty, but we're so thankful that you're here. When the building collapsed, it made this wedge like a triangle and it saved us. The father reached out and he said, come on out, boy. I said, no, let the others go first. Because I know no matter what, you're going to get me. I know no matter what, you'll be there for me. God has a promise in him and promise to people. And they keep grumbling and complaining and they keep saying it's helpless, it's hopeless. And the whole time, are you going to help me now? We need, we need the people that say, I'm not giving up. No matter how hopeless the situation looks, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. And, I'm, and not only am I not giving up on the promise of God, I'm not letting anybody else give up either. Are you going to help me now? But even if you don't, I'm going to keep digging. Are you going to help me now? But even if you don't, I'm going to keep walking. Are you going to help me now? But even if you don't, I'm going to say that God has given this land to us. Just like Caleb and Joshua did. So what is it? What is it for you? What are you a slave to? What's holding you back? From the abundant promise of God. And, and listen, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't even care about the physical part of it. You know, because I would probably Americanize it anyway. All right? What's keeping me back from the abundant freedom found in serving Jesus Christ? What's holding us back? taking a step to experience complete and total freedom. What stops me from those moments when I'm really into what's being said and God's working on my heart and he's gushing out and I want to like raise my hands and cry but I'm afraid of what you're going to think of me. What's holding me back? What's holding you back? What's keeping you a slave? keeping you from the promise of freedom. What makes, what makes us stop and to say, man, I was better off before. I get some of that sometimes. I work at the Gospel Rescue Mission in Muskogee. And they'll come sometimes and, and they need a place to stay and they need food and, and, and we're giving that. Um, as we do that, we say, now this is a life change center. This is a place where you're going to say, I commit to changing my life for the better. And so, come to chapel. We have a meeting. Take this class. Fill out this many job applications. And then pretty soon you're like, this isn't freedom. I was better off on the streets. I was better off homeless. I was better off with no food. I was better off trapped in my meth addiction and they keep going back. When what God says is I want to give you complete freedom. It's a lie from the enemy to say I was better before. And it's also a lie for me to say can't help you because you disagree with me. Let's live like freedom people and love like freedom people. Because that, church, is how you change the world. Thank you, guys. Uh. If you need prayer or something, I want to pray with you. If you can come while we...